the RTE Rugby World Cup podcast, sponsored by Bank of Ireland. Hello and welcome along to the RTE Rugby World Cup podcast. I'm Neil Tracy and I'm joined by Bernard Jackman, as usual, on a Thursday, as well as Charlie Morgan, senior rugby writer for The Telegraph, who's going to help us look ahead to the World Cup semi-finals this Friday and Saturday. New Zealand against Argentina, Friday night, South Africa versus England on Saturday both at Stade de France in Paris, both 8pm kickoffs. Before we get into that, though, we are going to be selfish, guys. We're going to milk the last few drops out of out of Ireland's Rugby World Cup campaign. Um, Birch, on, on Saturday, obviously, South Africa and France, and I watched that back last night as well for the first time, South Africa and France, and it did get me thinking about Ireland and how much new little things we saw from both France and South Africa in that game alone. How much, how many new, how many new things did we see from Ireland over the course of this, this world cup campaign? I'm, I'm, I'm even talking small variations on things. No, we probably didn't see any, and that's, that's probably, uh, or certainly not many. That's certainly sometimes the issue. If you, if you're unbeaten, um, you know, you're, you're so comfortable in how you play. And it's working, so why why change it? And probably, um, it's not a lesson because uh, I I don't need to teach. The, it's very hard to go any other way. Uh, but certainly getting things exposed a little bit out from a World Cup. Let's use the All Blacks as an example. You know, last summer, obviously, Root and Branch review of their coaching setup and very uncomfortable. And and you wouldn't want to be in a situation that Foster was in, but they had to make changes, and. You know now they're in a in a, an unbelievable position in terms of potentially going to win a World Cup, which twelve months ago was was unheard of. England have, have built their way into this. You know certainly not under the radar, uh, obviously under a lot of scrutiny and a lot of pressure to perform, but are now back within eighty minutes of a final. So it's it, it's it, it certainly was a bit of a, a a lesson for us in terms of how New Zealand were able to peak at that game and and bring different. Very different elements to it, and um, obviously South Africa, France, um, w- both showed a- another level. France are getting criticised a lot for playing, for overplaying, and and that's the, this, there's people after Galtier's head because they said that France built their their new game model on for three years around this. It's called anti-Jew, so not playing, um, kicking game defence, and that over the last year Galtier has gone away from that, and that that game against Ireland in Dublin. You know, afterwards, France said, "Oh, we we learned less from that. We overplayed." Uh, look, it's very hard to be critical of because they they went out and tore the Springbok defense apart. You know what I mean? But lost the game in the end, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's not an exact science. You could try and change and not get it right. You can stay in the same thing, not get it right, or stay doing the same thing and and, and master it. So, uh, but certainly, yeah, I think Fo- Foster's comments about the copy and paste attack at the end. It probably rings home a little bit as to us because, but at that stage, you're four points down. You're not going to go and try and do something different. You're going to go and do what you do. And there was opportunities. There was opportunities um, to hurt them. Uh, there was one time kill coin. If he had just given a pass, um, I think we we may have scored. Um, but to, to be able to execute all that stuff under the pressure and fatigue um, is insanely difficult. And, and we look at other things to the breakdown, the set piece. Um, not ability not to be able to deal with the high ball. They were all more important factors, I think, than not changing things, to be honest. Um but yeah, I think I think obviously Farlan and Easterby and O'Connell will will have a real look back now at everything they did and, and try and learn from. Charlie, always interesting to get the the view of someone who who doesn't necessarily have any skin in the game when it comes to to Ireland. You know, we're we're obviously we're all Irish, we're talking to Irish pundits all the time. I'm always interested to hear what those on the outside have to say. What was your what was your read on on Saturday night, or even just the course of the campaign, even from an Irish point of view? Well, I think I, I if to take over the course of the campaign first, I thought I thought Ireland's Ireland's draw was just beastly, wasn't it? And just them having to get through those successive games, South Africa and Scotland, and then a huge huge quarter final, whoever it was going to be, was always going to take a monumental effort so I would have I, I picked South Africa to to win the tournament before it started just because of their know-how around those big games but as Ireland went on they just looked more and more convincing to me um, and that attack 
I, I saw a comment a, a year ago, I think it was about, and it feeds into what you said at the top there, Birch, about how they'd always be the most analysed team in the world, not just because of the cohesion that they've got and the, the settled combinations they've got at national side, but because they're bringing them in, those settled fixtures in from 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 Leinster largely. Um, but that was going going so, so well. And I watched um, Saturday night on the way back from Wales, Argentina, outside a bar in Marseille. Um, and to be honest, was just in disbelief at how good New Zealand were and how multifaceted their performance was, not just going after the defensive breakdown, but also having a plan for the scrum, also having a plan for their for their set piece attack. And it looked like, and New Zealand supporters will probably detest this, it looked a little bit like England's performance against New Zealand in the semi-final um, in 2019, just for the fact that it was so clearly tailored towards a certain opponent. Um, and I wonder whether how much that takes out of a side the next week. So it'd be really interesting to see how New Zealand go against Argentina. But no, it was in, in disbelief, to be honest, at how good New Zealand were and how much they raised it, because I thought that Ireland would have enough. And I, Birch, I think you, you said it was a 50-50 all week, didn't you? I thought that Ireland would have enough um, to get through that game. Um, but just credit to, credit to New Zealand for having having got through it. But, you know, having said that, it's a shin width of Geordie, a Geordie Barrett shin width away from going through. And even that last long sequence, how good have you got to be? How slick have you got to be to go through 37 phases at that stage and be so close again? Um, you know, I thought thought what Ireland were uh, slightly below their best in, a, in what was a phenomenal game and yet still came so close. To... One final point, Birch, and we'll move it on to the to the two semi-finals. But now we're starting to think about what's happening in 2024 and beyond for Ireland, where Johnny Sexton obviously gone, Keith Earls is gone, and over the course of the next few years, we're probably going to see a few more players who are on that early to mid-30s age bracket either really, really have to dig in and fight for their place or slowly transition out of it. And while... Andy Farrell and a lot of players have said, you know, it is the end of an era based on the players who are going to departing to going to be departing. There is consolation and there's still obviously there's still a lot, a lot of work to be done to to blend these players in. But we've had a few years now of some seriously, seriously impressive under 20 sides. And if the right things are done and the right people are put in place and the right plans made. There is no reason why in four years' time Ireland can come back and have another serious crack at a World Cup. Yeah, look, Gregor Townsend said after Ireland beat them that Ireland should be at the top for the next four or five years. I think we should be in the top four. Um, I don't look. I, I don't see us pulling away, or like we obviously have to get ahead first. So it did. Like, it did should... feel. It did feel ever so slightly self-serving. Uh, I no, thought. I understand. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, but but he's but he's right in terms of the. The or the the foundations um of a good coaching staff who are staying, um four well funded provinces who win all the time, a good pathway system, like they're all there. So like I think we should be at knocking around the top four or five in the world, um for the next four four or five years. The challenge is to win a World Cup. You probably need we we need to some of those youngsters coming through. We need to find two or three. X factor players like players who can actually just turn a game. Mm-hmm. Um, so and obviously, you look now, you look now at, at certainly the the all blacks, the South Africans, England, Argentina. I'm, I'm they've got a couple of players, but you need players who on the day can just take a game by scruff and neck, like Sev- Sevilla did, like Barrett did, you know, um, like back in the last World Cup, Ducano Am did, you know, Ches and Kobe. Uh, like Manu, Manu has done at times over the course of his of his career, and and may do again over the next over the next two weeks if if all goes well for England. Like that's that's the challenge for us. I think we've got lots of really really good players, really good technical players, um, and that's probably what that copy and paste kind of attack meant. It was, it was phenomenal, and it's what we do. Um, but wow, you don't have to go thirty seven phases. The All Blacks wouldn't have to go thirty seven phases because you know Will Jordan or whoever would have would have made something happen. Um, and that's the challenge for us. And that's not easy because those, those type of athletes are, are, yeah, are, are special talents. They don't, they don't come through the system very often. You can be lucky if, if you get two or three in the same generation. Um, and that's, that's what we need now. We need probably two, two players to come from nowhere for the next World Cup cycle to be able to, 
to take a quarterfinal on and and dominate it. Um, and unfortunately, on the night, when you look back at all the Irish performances, uh, it's very hard to say that any one Irish player had a huge, huge impact on the game, like a Sam Kane or a Sevilla or or you know a Will Jordan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The the very very last final point, actually, Birch. Um, in twenty twenty seven, I know it's largely dependent on on who comes through and what areas and what the depth is. Is Andrew Porter playing loose head or tight head for Ireland at the next World Cup? I think he's going back to tight heads. I think you'll see some really good loose heads coming through. Um, yeah, and, and Justin Leinster, Jack Boyle, um, Paddy McCarthy is going McCarthy. back across. Yeah, so I, I, I think he, he'll end up back tight heads, to be fair. Yeah. Charlie, any, any any final thoughts on Ireland before we close this book or anything nice to say to us to make us feel a little bit better <laughs> before we move on? Well, just to, get, to go back to what Gregor Townsend said, I know you're saying it's self-serving there, but there's certainly a sense of envy over here as far as the pathway system and how smooth that looks and how prolific that looks because England are, we'll get into it, but England are doing, having this World Cup run and they're, they're not going to be able to pick um, half of their half of their squad next season, let alone sort of in four years' time just because there's a lot of players going to France and the um, the pathway system there has needed has needed kind of repair after a few years of sort of of it being quite bitty and there being quite a few bad decisions um, higher up the chain. So yeah, there's certainly I think there's certainly a sense over here too that the island's success is um, sustainable and it, and is going to be going to be more permanent than than just this tournament, as disappointing as this tournament will ultimately feel. On on England then, and we'll move on to that semi final against South Africa Saturday night. Kind of, we said at the start, we haven't actually spoken a huge amount about England over the course of the World Cup. We've kind of been focused mainly on Ireland and the potential opponents Ireland were going to have. But um, probably since the the warm up game in Dublin, Charlie, was when we last spoke about England in any great detail, and we didn't say particularly nice things about them that day. Um, the the mood around the the press who were there at the Aviva Stadium that afternoon, I would describe as just exasperation at what was happening with England. But over the course of the last six, eight weeks, obviously things have changed. The results have picked up here. Here they are in a, in a world cup semi-final. Um, have they, you might tell us, have, have they got their kind of kicking and screaming or have we seen development in the attack and, and the, and the defense and a bit more cohesion around the squad? Like, have they got there by just, you know, rolling up the sleeves and, and dogging it out, or have they developed as a rugby team? I think they've developed a, as a rugby team, and I think it's I think it's really hard to hear maybe at the time when there's so much excitement over the World Cup. So on the eve of the World Cup, they were going to be a pretty horrible rugby team because of the part of the process that they were at. So they were they'd come together. I've, I've heard it said that they they had four year they had three months to get through four years of work. That's just because of how when they changed um, head coach was Steve Borthwick coming in for Eddie Jones before the last Six Nations and then Alan Walters coming in ahead of the World Cup preseason. They had to, they felt that they had to work really hard during those warm-up games even to just, because fitness was a big work on, was identified as a big work on, sorry, during the Six Nations and them fading away in games and their fitness not being tailored to the game plan, um, which which clearly clearly was having a big effect on them. Um, so it's been, it's, they have, they have, in fairness to them, they have said throughout that their message has just been, look, it's, we're going to peak at the right time. And in fairness, they did their draw as kind of, we alluded to earlier on has been super kind, um, not only because of who they were playing in that, in that pool, but also it was when they were, when they were doing it. So they had to peak after the warm up games, after those four warm up games. And by the way, before Ireland is sort of coming out that they, they trained their load was 40% higher than a normal test week. And they'd actually had a, <clears throat> on the Tuesday, they'd, they, they think that their GPS numbers hit, hit a normal test match. So they were really, <clears throat> it was almost like a reverse of Ireland in 2019. Um, but no, they got, got through that peaked for the Argentina game, got through the Japan game, played, played pretty well in patches in that game. And then against Chile, and then they had this second, um, second break, and they went hard at that because they were in the fortunate position of having won their group and actually having nothing to gain um, for that last game against Samoa. That was obviously a bit tricky again. 
Um, but then they've won that and got through the to, through the Fiji game too. I guess as far as areas of their game that are getting more polished, their discipline, the things that are letting them down when they're playing badly, breakdown, discipline, and just looking a little bit leggy, which kind of feed, which bleeds into every area of the game, I guess. And that just when those things get more polished, they haven't got the most intricate game plan, absolutely not. But they're if they're hardworking, fit, and they are accurate in areas like set piece. I think they feel like feel like they can go a long way. The the um, expertise of Walters is a big part of that. And one just just to finish, sort of one really encouraging aspect of how they went against Fiji was that it became a real dogged sort of messy messy game at the breakdown. And you've seen England lose those games time and time again against against sides who have got good strong jacklers like Levani Bottia. Um, Fiji picked Tuisui in the second row. They've obviously got Tuisui. They've got guys that can really go after you and hurt you there. And it was about sort of 10 minutes into the game, you could see a tangible sense of England going, right, Nachi I was letting this game be a total mess. We're going we're gonna to gonna scrap pretty hard on the floor too. And that came off for them. And that is, for me, that is tangible process, progress, not just from where they've been in the World Cup games, but actually where they've been sort of historically and, the, and how they've tended to lose games. What have you thought of England, Birch? I, I do remember after the, the game against Ireland when we were chatting and while a lot of people were criticising their attack a lot, one of the things you were quite critical of was, was their defence and just how easily they were they were giving up a lot of tries. What have you seen in terms of improvements on, on that area of the pitch for them? Yeah, look, I, I think they're they're building obviously incredibly well. I think when you have players, the players that they have who've been to a World Cup final, who have... You know, if you even just look at those Saracens players alone, you know, won European uh, titles, won premierships. It's hard for them to get to the emotional pitch all the time. Um, and kind of like the All Blacks, I mean, you know, there's a dip. There can be a dip in terms of what we see and, and the systems look really poor. And we blame the systems, but we don't understand that those players are, are, aren't, are you know, as as emotionally pitched as they, as they need to be. So I think England have built this really well. I totally agree. I think having Alan Walters there, someone who's won a World Cup, um, to be able to say to them, look, this is this is going to have us peaking at the right time. And obviously, because of England's record in a World Cup, in World Cups, um, you know, they don't have that mental hangover that we have. So, you know, we mentioned 2019, doing a heavy week, the week of the England game. That makes sense. That makes sense. But if the performance is as bad as it was for Ireland... Um, and you don't have that uh, experience of of doing well in World Cups. It just adds to the to the doom and gloom and knocks your confidence. Whereas I think England, obviously, they have players who who can just say, yeah, that that makes sense. We don't judge it against Ireland. Judges of all were like in the knockout stages, and uh, I still don't think their defense is perfect. I thought Fiji, uh, like uh, Fiji, look, I know people say Fiji can do it to anybody, um, and they are they are very uh, explosive. But I, I don't think the defence is as good as it maybe will need to become over the next two weeks if they're going to win it. But certainly they're on a in a right place. This, all the soundings from the squad are, are positive. Bortwick, even though he's inexperienced as a head coach at international level, has won a trophy with with a game model that uh, would lead you to believe um, is the best way of playing. Like the teams who were trying to play too much um, aren't really get, getting uh are, are going to find it harder as you go as you go forward. Having good halfbacks is key, you know. Um, good set piece. So yeah, there's so many there's so many things that are starting to align for England. Um, and also the box. I mean, the box had a massive game against Ireland. Um, uh, had a massive game last weekend against France, which obviously they built up for. Are they going to be able to go to the well again? Are they going to be able to see that danger in England that isn't clearly there but we know on on a day they can bring it um and if they drop off slightly and England up it slightly th- th- that game is no cakewalk so uh um it's going to be I-, I think it's going to be tight it's going to be tight and and England ha- have have a chance a sure chance in lead that leads us on nicely then in terms of tactically charlie the obvious question how do England break down and how do England beat South Africa at the weekend because if you go back to November of last year South Africa 27-13 winners at Twickenham a lot of people would probably say South Africa are a better team now than they were when they comfortably they comfortably beat England just just under 12 months ago 
England are maybe roughly at the same level or marginally better, but South Africa are certainly considerably better off than where they were just under 12 months ago. Yeah, I'd, I'd say I'd say both sides are considerably better off just just because of the the sort of feeling around that autumn campaign for England was right. was was that nothing was going right and was that Eddie, Eddie Jones was sort of on the way out and actually they've got a, they've got a template of how to in the last two games they played each other twice in this World Cup cycle and it's one one and they've got a template of how to trouble South Africa and they've got a template of how to get absolutely pumped, which is what they did last time. Um, but the first time they, in 2021, they kicked really cleverly from the start. They actually, they actually went into it with Bevan Rod at loose head, um, with Jamie Blamire at, at hooker and Nick Dolly at, at replacement hooker. So they, their type five was pretty pretty well depleted. Um, but without that set piece, what they did was kick really really cleverly. Um, didn't spend too much time in in, in possession. They scored they scored off either either off they made first phase possession really really count and they scored three tries um which they're gonna they're gonna have to do and they've scored one try i think in five world cup games against south africa so something's gonna have to go a bit differently but that that foundation of of kicking and making sure that they're taking their chances is clearly going to be going to be huge and a year later um eddie jones afterwards in what turned out to be his last kind of post-match press conference just said look every Every contest area, the scrum, the line out, aerially, the breakdown, everything went badly. And it did. And that the game gets away from you there. So that they know sort of where they have to be, um, have to be, have to be a lot better there. I would say under Borthwick, who the point Birch is making there about them being um being comfortable with having gone through a choppy patch during the warm-ups, he is the ideal personality, what we keep hearing. Um, is that he's the ideal personality to just make sure it's a week by week focus. And that was what, this is what kept getting trotted out during the Leicester Tigers um, premiership winning campaign was it's week by week. I'm not, I'm honestly not thinking about what's next. I'm honestly not thinking about what's next. And by the end you thought, geez, they are living that more than I've ever known any sports team to live it. And it is the most banal thing in the world, but they're, they're buying into it. And it's kind of, and this road now that they've been on has led them to this game against South Africa. And I think they'll go in with a really clear idea of how they want to play. And I think they'll be disciplined about that. And I think that the team is being announced in, um, in a few hours, but we expect Stewart to come back in at 15. And in the game against Argentina, you remember that he, he was not just used as a sort of defensive kind of mechanism at fullback. He was used on the front foot as well a bit. And I think that'll be a big in for them, hopefully that I'll use, um, but yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I'm, I would say South Africa are still favorites by a long way or well, they are favorites by a long way. And I'd be surprised if England got past them, but I think, I think they've got enough discipline there to get in enough discipline and, and, and investment in their game plan to get close. Yeah. Like if you're picking one of the two semifinals that could be close, this is, this is probably the one you'd, you'd lean towards. Um, on Stewart coming back, well, probably coming back in, Birch, I think we're all assuming it, but just like how important he's going to be from the kicking side of things. Like you look at what South Africa did to France with their kicking in that first half. It was just, it was like a masterclass of just picking the right spots to put the ball into. With that first try, you've got Weenie Antonio and I think it was like Cameron Walkie over there and just making a meal of it and the pressure they were able to put them under having someone like Freddie Stewart in there and having him on form under high balls is going to be absolutely vital. Yeah, that's that, that's absolutely key against the box. And even though a lot of people felt, oh, Springboks played better attacking rugby and, and they did have a little bit more ambition, it was based around playing two phases and then bang, going to the air with the right people chasing, putting the right pressure on. And I mean, even the wildest streams, they wouldn't have believed they would have got two tries from directly from contestables. And then yeah. obviously the third one was a turnover and a, and a lovely kick through from Creel. Um, so England need to be good there, and if you are good there, it, it it turns the game. You know, if you're catching those balls clearly, and then you're you're able to exit or kick back on the front foot, it's a game changer. Uh, now the box generally win those battles, but you know Stuart is probably one of the best in the world at um under those high balls, and I think that's actually a. I think if Marcus Smith played. They would go after him and uh, and go after him in a in a way that he won't be able to bring his strength, which is obviously bringing it back from from deep. Um, they go after him very much in the air, and I don't think it'd be. I think it's a huge ask to come in 
um at that level and, and be able to dominate the sky. And and with Ireland, Ireland against New Zealand lost a lot of those aerial battles as well. And it was a key part of the game. So um it's it's massively important. And I think England um have a have a have a player there in short that could could basically put in a type of performance that afterwards we're saying that's that was the key to victory. Um final thoughts on on this game. I was sitting, Charlie, I was sitting beside Birch at the Stade de France on Saturday, so I know how much he he loves the scrum off the mark. You were writing about it during the week as well. And I know it's such a small thing and such a massive game to be getting excited about, but like it does kind of sum up how how comfortable and at ease South Africa are with their own plans and their own game. Yeah, and, and more than that, I think how just how much they think about the narrative of a whole game, not just from a sort of swagger point of view, but um how much they know that one they have confidence in that in that scrum and that that scrum is going to get dominance and then what that dominance then does for the rest of the game um yeah i loved it i absolutely loved it i didn't know what was going on at first but i loved it loved it after that as soon as yeah and just the the kind of manner was pretty cool wasn't it putting it down and then um then calling for it yeah lots to like but just just so sort of so sort of emblematic of how they've operated under under Erasmus and Inaba, just really really clever as well as quite quite menacing. Yeah, and it was just like it was the the fact Birch as soon as he caught the ball, he just put it straight down in the ground and signaled for the scrum. Like you knew straight away it was it was something that had been planned way out. It wasn't just Valencia in the moment thinking a scrum would be a good idea here now. Yeah, and it was obviously only if, if it was a long um, a long kick into the twenty two, um, and it was just. It was psychological warfare as well, and then they had they backed it up obviously by winning the penalty and, and from the penalty advantage, going all the way down the field. And if you're if you're like you have to understand the mentality of the French. I mean, the scrum is the melee is 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 their heart. You know, at top fourteen level, it's absolutely uh, a key factor, key focus point for every every team. And to see a team, no matter whether it's South, even South Africa, actually calling you down and and you you know and and actually. They would have known. I mean, Galtier spoke about the selection from South Africa, um, and about Razi and and Nino Bar being, you know, really smart st- strategically. And we saw that in terms of the team they picked. It was with a view to not getting involved in those kick battles, which I think South Africa traditionally would have just said, right, we 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 do this all the time. We'll just play your game and we'll do it better than you. Whereas they said, no, we actually don't want to play kick tennis and allow your front five just basically. Do little short shuttles on the halfway line. We're going to run it back. We're going to make you tackle, Antonio, etc. Um, and then we're going to get to the middle of the field. And then we're going to put a bomb up on, on, on your on your wingers with Peter Steph de Trois or Khaleesi out there helping. So it was brilliant. But that flex it happened to me before, and in, in a you know this place, Neil Buccaneers back in the day. Buccaneers had a massive pack, and uh, I was playing for a Tontarf team that didn't. And from the kickoff. All the forwards went to this, the the uh, the or the center point of the pitch, and the ten just kicked it as hard as he could into the stand, and basically, but it was our ball, it was our scrum, and then we were like, right, we, we got to basically lock this out. We get pushed off it, and the, the tone was set, and we had a very uncomfortable day. So, but I've never seen anyone at international level do what they did. And in fairness to to Razi, um, and the the box. They're not just mutants um, who are all about... We talk about battle stats and we talk about fucking people up and, and that's what we're, we hear from them. But there's actually a lot of uh, really smart thinking there as well and uh, it has to be admired, I think, you know? Yeah, it really does. It's been brilliant to see and I think a lot of people have have turned in their opinions on South Africa over the, the course of the last 12 months with the way they've they've gone through this World Cup. We will move on to New Zealand and Argentina, though, because we're, we're running out of time here. Charlie, you said it right at the, at the top of the show, how difficult it is to see New Zealand being able to repeat last week's performance and hit those same kind of emotional pitches as they did against Ireland. The big question then, though, is do they have to? Do they, do they actually need to reach that level again against Argentina in a semi-final? I'm not trying to be disrespectful here, but you could see them falling off quite a few percent and still being able to have enough to get the job done this weekend. You could, yeah. I think their their aggregate last two game games is something like ninety points to fifteen. So it's huge. They've just um they've taken them apart in the last two games they've played them. They don't have I don't think they have Matera, do they? Who who was who's been huge for them in those two games that they have beaten New Zealand over the last World Cup cycle. Um 
yeah so it's gonna have to it's gonna have to be a really really big drop off and it's gonna have to be a lot better from Argentina than we have seen because they, they were I mean they've had a really interesting World Cup because if I mean if England have had a really interesting World Cup Argentina were horrible against them in that first game in Marseille just awful um and it was actually really difficult to see them sort of surviving games against Samoa and Japan subsequently because even psychologically they just looked spent but Checkers and it's whether it's a bit of hindsight biased and it sort of suits his suits his narrative he spoke really well after the Wales game saying look I've been around World Cups different World Cups he got to the final with Australia in 2015 and then the quarter he went out in and four years later but he said just the draw is everything and being able to time and almost settle into the tournament and he spoke about how in the Pumas, current Puma squad, there are a lot of players who were having their first taste of a World Cup. And he said that that England game was sort of useful as far as acclimatising. Um, and they were, I was at, I was at the Wales, the Wales um, Argentina quarter. And that was a bit of, there was a bit of chaos there as well with poor Jaco Piper pinging his yeah. car. Um, but Argentina, Argentina adapted better to that. And Wales should have been out of sight on the half, halfway, on half, half an hour in. Um, but Argentina came back strongly. They've got firepower out wide. They've got big lads. Marcos Kramer will have to make 20 odd tackles, I imagine, at the weekend to, on Friday night, sorry, for them to get close. And they'll have to sort of exert a bit of authority at the defensive breakdown. But I guess you never I guess you never know. But yeah, New Zealand being 18 point favourites, I think, isn't doesn't flatter them. Birch, you know Michael Checker fairly well. Um yeah. you would have you would have played under him. What what way do you think he would be approaching this game? Like, what what would he be looking for in New Zealand's performance last week in Ireland that he could just about cling on to and just about try find something that he can he can exploit? Well, look, I think they're Argentina are different than the Argentina of old. So, um, they are trying to play like on Australia and New Zealand and Ireland, uh, and that's probably got them into into trouble a little bit. The, the skill set hasn't looked as good in the group stages as as it would need to be. Um, but also I thought that they didn't handle the pressure well. They didn't handle the pressure of, may, of being favourites against England and becoming massive favourites once that red card happened. And they just imploded. I mean, and it, they it was only really the Wales game where, where we've actually seen them back to something like the team that we, we, we expected to see them in this World Cup. And, and Cheka will, will, will talk about that. Cheka, in fairness, has been he's a huge amount of experience at, at all levels, but at international levels, World Cups, and you know, Felipe Condoponi is part of his staff, and you know they've they've been deep into into competitions, uh, in, in in teams who maybe didn't have as much talent, but had a had probably a, a closed a more closed game plan. That's going to be a challenge for me. Is that I uh, sorry? Come back to your original question. What would Czech say? He'll say that there's holes in that in that all back defense. I mean, um, the the last defensive stand was amazing. Uh, but their defense for the Bundiaki try wasn't wasn't brilliant. Um, Ireland stretched them down the, the edges quite a few times, and and in fairness, to Argentina they've got players with with ability out there, and they do want to get there. So I I don't think I don't think they're you would say that their defense is is unbreakable, and I think that's what Checo will be building on. And I think they're much better as underdogs. They're way better as underdogs, um, and they're on a freebie now. They're on a freebie, and and that celebration, that connection with their fans. That we saw after the game, all that will, will lead into a feel good factor up to Paris now. Um, so I think they'll get to a different level emotionally. And then, as, as Charlie said, maybe New Zealand um, will just be slightly off and it'll be a little bit more uh, more level. But looking at that, that, that all black squad now, and look at, I mean, um, it's, it's very hard to see an upset, to be honest, in, in that game. And as a motivator, when you are an underdog, is Czech up there with. One of the best people you oh, want yeah. to have around in a in a change yeah. room before a game like that. Yeah, no, he loves that. He loves that, and um, I know there's been issues. They feel that they've been getting treated like second class citizens a little bit. Balls not arriving, training pitch, etc. And he loves all that stuff as well. He was hard to do with Leinster when we when we had a lot of the best resources, but um, uh, certainly with Argentina, yeah, he 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 would play that underdog card really well and. Uh, smart guy, smart operator. Probably cool down. He's a lot calmer than he was when I had him, um, which isn't a bad thing. But uh, I think, I think he gives him that figurehead um, of someone who's been there, done that, and has talked about. I love to hear him talk about the the way you the way you approach a a qualifying campaign, and you know how they just did what they needed to do to a certain extent and peaking at the right time and 
sending all the right messages to try and get a big performance out of his team. And there's some good players in there for sure. But if the All Blacks pitch up like they did last week, very, very hard to see Argentina get even within 10 points, I think. Yeah, Charlie, you said you were in Marseille watching them against against Wales last week. Was was there anything in that performance in terms of attack that you thought could could pose a threat for, for either Ireland or, or New Zealand when you were looking at it at the time? It was I've been so low on them, honestly. I, I was I was haste, hasten to word uh, use the word disgusted, but that would that was how bad the the England perform the performance against England was. It was just and, they, so and they weren't much better the following week against against no. Noah either. In fairness, no, that was a horrible game. They've they've they just they they they've guys one on one. Matteo Carreras over here has just been has been spellbinding for Newcastle in a in a sort of living off. Yeah, maybe not living off a lot of amazing ball, but is always sort of last couple of years has been top of the sort of try scoring charts just because his phenomenal footwork so so quick. Um, they've got they've got good yeah as, as Birch mentioned there they've got good good runners out wide feeding that. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's whether they just take one or two try scoring try scoring chances. Issa um has been has been there instead of Matera. He's he's a good carrier. Gonzalez is obviously a, a sort of really special player. And then Kramer's just this brute. So they've got that nicely balanced sort of back five of the pack. It's just so much is going to have to go right for them. They have they have those individuals, but so much is going to have to go right for them. And I just wonder whether they double down on spending time without the ball and just making sure that they strike in strike in transition. I think that's probably the best best way to go about it. Right. Final thoughts then. Um it feels a bit inevitable, but I'm going to ask anyway. Predictions: Who's going to be playing each other in the final next week? Bert, you can lead the way. Yeah, box all blacks. Nothing changes. And Charlie? Yeah, no, I'm I'm the same. I, but I just I'm interested to see how close England, how close England get to an upset. Yeah, I think we're all fairly set on what the final probably will be. It's a case of can we get a couple of decent games this weekend. Fellas, it's been great. Thanks a million. Birch is always on a Thursday. And Charlie, thanks for stopping in. Who knows? We might be coming back to you next week ahead of a, a World Cup final. Who knows? But uh, listen, up, Charlie. coming up this Friday, New Zealand against Argentina, live on RT2 and RT Player on Friday night. And also URC back this weekend. Leinster away to Glasgow. That's back on RT Television as well on Sunday afternoon. The RTE Rugby World Cup Podcast, sponsored by Bank of Ireland.